It's so great to be here with you all again. We had such an amazing time um, the first time around. And for those of you who weren't here with us, um, we thought we would share a little bit about our collective and what we identify as Borderlands Shakespeare to give us a foundation for the um, workshop that we're gonna do here today. So what is Borderlands Shakespeare? Um, over the past three or four years, um, the three of us have been collecting examples of appropriations of Shakespeare plays that are made of and by Chicanx and Latinx authors and audiences um, in the borderlands. And we have found some really amazing examples. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on border hamlets, but we have found examples of Romeo and Juliet, um, La Comedia of Errors, um, all kinds of Shakespeare plays. There are several Marco Macbeths. Um, so there's so much to explore in terms of um, issues of the border, um, issues of immigration, of identity, and really trying to put the, or understand the context of the borderlands within uh, Shakespearean frames. We work with um, several different amazing uh, sponsors. Um, we were we have done lots of media. Our pretty much a crowning achievement, I guess, <laughs> was going on the Fronteras um, show with Norma um, Martinez over there on the left. You can see us um, speaking with her on the National Public Radio show. Um, there's also a lot of collaboration with uh, local theater groups. So on the bottom right there, you can see Kate and I hanging out with the cast of the tragic Corrido of Romeo and Lupe at the FAR Community Center in FAR, Texas on the border. Um, we also work with the local Teatro Audaz here in San Antonio. Um, they're going to be helping us put on a production um, when we gather in March for our conference. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, there's also beautiful um, events with students. As you can see, um, Katie up there in the upper right hand corner with one of her students. And then in the lower left hand corner there, um, a reading that students did in a gorgeous canyon at West Texas and um, university. We have identified Borderlands Shakespeare appropriations um, in this way. They emphasize the value, beauty, and restorative power of indigenous Chicanx languages, genres, mythologies, and rituals, providing a counterpoint to the Western epistemologies conveyed in their source texts. And you can see this beautiful cover for the Bard in the Borderlands anthology in which we have collected the plays. This is volume one, but there will be a, subsequently a volume two and volume three coming out in 2024 and 2025. This cover art was commissioned by uh, Rio Grande Valley artist Celeste de Luna. She's a, a print maker and um, just a, a beautiful rendition of some of the iconography of the borderlands um, represented here. Wonderful. So as we taught these plays, um, we've begun to see how essential they are um, for teaching Shakespeare in culturally sustaining ways, um, and also just how well students respond uh, to this work in general. And so I know just um, a show of hands, how many of you were here for the first workshop that we did? Or maybe... Um, write it in the chat. Okay, so some of you, some of you were, that's wonderful. Um, so y'all have, will have heard some of this before, but just as a refresher, um, and um, for everybody else um, who hasn't been here, we think there are a number of reasons why it's beneficial to integrate some of these Borderlands texts into, um, 
the, your classroom. Um, sometimes full plays, but also excerpts or poetry as we'll be talking about today. So there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that it offers um, various points of access allowing students to bring themselves and their knowledges to Shakespeare's works. And as we'll talk about today, it can be a way of helping students actually understand Shakespeare itself like a little bit better, but it can also really validate students and the forms of knowledge that arise from their own communities as well. Um, in addition, it drives conversations about the complex mixture of languages, Englishes, Spanishes, Spanglishes, and indigenous languages uh, throughout um, the place, but also um, both Shakespeare and the Borderlands plays and in the region itself. So I know many of us teach in multilingual classrooms to various um, degrees, and this really helps students develop more of a critical language awareness. In addition, um, Borderlands um, adaptations of Shakespeare help us all consider contemporary resonances of Shakespeare and the differences across and similarities across historical and geographical regions, um, historical periods and geographical regions. And it also invites creative responses to Shakespeare rather than seeing the works as static and fixed in time. And we have found that this really helps students um, really approach Shakespeare with less trepidation and a little more comfort. So the time that we'll spend with you today will really flesh out a lot of what I'm about to say, but we thought we would start by outlining some approaches that we have developed and other teachers have developed to teaching with these plays or to teaching these plays themselves, um, because we do actually think they could be taught with outside of the context of Shakespeare. Um, but one strategy is to compare the themes in Shakespeare's plays with various Borderlands adaptations using either just scenes um, or full plays. We, we know that oftentimes it's difficult to bring yet another text into your already packed um, schedule. So just bringing in scenes can be really helpful in asking our students what changes in Borderlands context, what might become clearer or deeper as a result, um, what do we see in Shakespeare that we couldn't see until we were using these texts. We could, um, and we do analyze language with our students, first asking um, what Shakespeare's text means or might mean, um, what is the value of or the effect of translating or adapting that language? In some ways, this might be reversed, right? We might look at the translation first as a way back into Shakespeare's texts because we know that that can often be difficult for students. And we can ask our students what they think about hearing or reproducing Shakespeare in Spanish or Spanglish or whatever languages they bring to the text. The third approach is to explore borderlands cultures, genres, geographies, and histories through these texts and to think about how these various facets of borderlands culture relate to Shakespeare's early modern English context. Those contexts, the early modern English contexts, are very likely foreign um, to our students. So if we start them in places that feel more familiar, they might have an understanding of, of the historical context in which Shakespeare was writing. Um, and then we can also, um, and we've had a, a lot of success with inviting our students to create their own adaptations, appropriations, translations, and remixes once they have these examples um, to inspire them and to really give them permission to uh, appropriate Shakespeare's texts for themselves. So sorry. So you may recognize the iconic imagery of Hamlet um, holding the skull of Yorick. It's an image that um, is really associated with Shakespeare and, and this iconic play. Um, probably Shakespeare's best known character, Hamlet, um, unsurprisingly, is one of the most ad adapted and performed plays. Um, artists in La Frontera often redirect these existential questions of Hamlet um, within a kind of borderlands consciousness that is explored by theorist Gloria E. Anzaldúa, 
was herself from the borderlands. Um, the photo that you see here is a, from a production of Tara Moses's Hamlet, El Principe de Denmark um, from 2018. This play is in volume one of The Bard in the Borderlands. And we think that it would pair well with a reading of Gloria Ansaldúa. Um, one of her famous quotes from Borderlands La Frontera approaches this question of identity um, and a, a split identity or hybrid identity um, and La Frontera and the kind of third space or a hybrid space of the border. She writes, the US-Mexican border es una herida abierta where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. So she explores um, this coming together of cultures in both violent and um, artistically productive ways. Um, here you see another image by Celeste de Luna, one of her um, early paintings, Tu Cuerpo es una Frontera, in which um, you see her children being sort of separated by the border, um, the border being her body and um, the river and the other elements sort of playing a really important role, um, just the ecosystem of the border being represented. Gloria Ansaldúa writes about this um, in very complex and nuanced ways in her poem that also appears in Borderlands La Frontera, To Live in the Borderlands Means You. And we'd like to call you Adriana, I'm sorry to interrupt you super quickly. I just wanted to make sure people could read the poem. It's looking a little blurry for some reason on the screen, so I can actually share my um PowerPoint um, and see if it will look, if it will work a little better. So we'll see if this, see if it works. I'm sorry to interrupt your beautiful explanation of the, of the poem here. No problem at so, all. I'm sorry, a little my clearer? internet must. Yes, Kate, that's clearer. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Th sorry about that. My internet must be um, sketchy. <laughs> that's a really so, um, <laughs> We'd like to call your attention to um, two uh, parts of the poem in particular, those that you can see highlighted in white. In the borderlands, you are the battleground where enemies are kin to each other. You are at home, a stranger. The border disputes have been settled. The volley of shots have scattered the truce. You are wounded, lost in action, dead, fighting back. To survive the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras, be a crossroads. So here you really get that sense of the um, clashing of cultures and then also um, the kind of um, identity understandings um, that artists kind of um, are working through when they're thinking through issues of social justice and the border. So we wanted to think about what it means um, and what Borderlands poets are articulating that it means to conceive of Hamlet in a Borderlands context, in that context of border consciousness that Anzal Dua so beautifully illustrates. And so first of all, I don't know how many of y'all have read or taught Hamlet recent, recently, <laughs> you don't have any recent experiences. I know sometimes um, it's been a minute and there's a lot that happens in the place. So we thought we'd give you this um, quick recap, right? So of course, Hamlet is um, sad that his father died and that his um, stepfather, um, I guess, killed him. And so the ghost comes back, right? We know all of that. Um, there's a lot about gender. There's a lot about Hamlet's angst about getting revenge against his father's um, killer, his anxiety about his mother 
mother's sexuality, his relationship with Ophelia, who of course dies, and then all these sort of sociopolitical questions at the end about who's in control, you know, of of the state of Denmark. Um, and of course, the mass tragedy right at the end. We have um, poor Hamlet who dies at the end. Um, and so there are plays, um, as um, Adriana was talking about, um, Hamlet El Principe de Denmark is a whole adaptation of Hamlet in a borderlands context that really thinks about the play through the more indigenous and Mexican um, lens of Dia de los Muertos. Um, but there are also a number of adaptations that take as their subject and also kind of jumping off point Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy, which is perhaps right the most um, famous soliloquy in all of European literature, perhaps, you know, so, so it's a, it's a big one. Um, and so we wanted to think with you all specifically today about how we can help students understand this speech, but also use it to spark their own creative imaginations through engagement with borderlands adaptations and appropriations. So I just wanted to start by asking you all, I know, especially since it's a small group, um, have you had any experiences uh, teaching Hamlet or teaching the soliloquy in particular that you would like to share? Just um, feel free to pop your ideas in the chat or to to share them. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so Laura says you'll be finishing act three. How is it going? Sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> um, I usually just have mine um, just kind of write a Add a short essay about what's going on. Um, and we read, I, people think I'm crazy, but we read the entirety of Hamlet out loud in class. <laughs> it takes a while, um, but the kids love it. And it's my AP lit kids, so they can actually kind of read it. <laughs> and it's not super painful. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we stop and talk a lot um, throughout it. And we also use the no fear version, which I don't really like too much but the kids love it it's a good security blanket for them and it really does help them to understand in context instead of waiting until we're done uh, that's wonderful about. I love the idea of reading it out loud I think you get so much more from that experience I think I have to read parts out loud to myself as well just to sort of hear them and have that embodied experience um, and I really appreciate, um, Kate, your point in the, the chat about having uh, students translate it. We're actually going to bring that up soon as well, like translating it into language that students are comfortable with, whatever that language that language is. Um, do you all find that students struggle with the to be or not to be soliloquy? Or maybe not, <laughs> which is good. I think for me, that's one, this is probably the soliloquy that they understand the most. And I think it's because, like you said, they've been exposed to it to some mm -hmm. degree before they get to me. And so they kind of already like have a preview of what's going They're on. They're sort of familiar with, well, with well. the basic idea, right? Like, is it worth living when we have to put up with all of these, you know, the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, right? All of these injustices, right? That are, that are done to us. Um, anybody else have experiences, either your, your own or students um, with teaching the soliloquy or any challenges with the vocabulary or just kind of like reading Shakespeare that you've experienced? Yeah, I, I guess I've found that, yes, I agree that in some ways students are familiar. I also have sometimes find like students have ideas in their mind that don't always match what's like actually in the text. So sometimes that unpacking process of what exactly it means, the sort of I, there's the rub, the, those sort of issues, like what's causing the, the hesitation, right? Uh, uh, the fact that this is, um, you know, in some ways difficult because it is a speech about suicide, um, but that it's also part of this, um, you know, kind of psychological arc of, of the character um, as well and leads up to this question about whether he will actually pursue revenge, like what is preventing him from, from acting. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, here, if I can move to the next slide successfully. Let's see here. Oops, sorry. 
Um, so we wanted to talk with you all about some guiding questions and we have some uh, intertext to share with you. So we wanna think about what teaching performance, including performance might add to students' understanding of the, the speech. We also wanted to think about questions of identity. I think a lot of times students feel rightfully so, I think, that Hamlet is like this kind of quintessential white male figure. He has been held up, right, as like the human. Um, and the and the to be or not to be speech, right, is often considered a mark of his sort of interiority that we're talking not just about like a character here, but a person that Shakespeare's genius is like such in this play, right? That we're being really presented with like human psychology. Like um, he's inventing the human at this moment, according to some people like Harold Bloom, right? And I think we can take issue with that, but I also think students can feel that weight, even if they don't know that history exactly. And so I think um, one thing to consider, right, is what it means to hear different people, right, with different identities, different bodies, different accents, performing the speech and how that can kind of change their interpretation um, and how they think about their own relationship to, you know, these canonical works of Western literature. Uh, we also wanted to talk about translation. So I'm really glad, um, Kate, that you mentioned that um, activity that you do. So I think having um, these chances for students to translate um, Shakespeare either into their own home languages if they're not English or into other more modern you know, versions of English that they're more familiar with can be really helpful. It can also help, as I said earlier, students develop more of an awareness about questions of translanguaging, like different kinds of language people use um, in different social circumstances. Um, and then we also wanted to talk more too about how incorporating other borderlands texts can help students understand Shakespeare's language in new ways um, that are um, culturally sustaining rather than alienating. So thank you to Kate for um, talking about how important it is for students to see um, these texts performed. And so we thought we'd show what we find to be one of the most accessible performances of the To Be or Not To Be soliloquy by Andrew Scott of Fleabag and um, Sherlock fame, you may recognize him. So enjoy. We chose this also because um, Andrew Scott has this the beautiful Irish accent. Um, and a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today is sort of the different um, languages and um, just the, the speech of the to be or not to be soliloquy. We also included here a modern English translation that could be useful. Um, Laura earlier mentioned that she used the No Fear Shakespeare, which um, is a useful tool, I think, for a lot of young readers and teachers. Um, so there is um, a lot of ways that the text can be translated. And one of the ones that we would love to show you today is directly from Tara Moses's Hamlet, El Principe de Denmark. And it is read by a dear friend and colleague, um, Dr. Brenda um, Terzada. And she's going to be reading here um, a bilingual version of the to be or not to be soliloquy. And this was from an appearance of the four of us, uh, Nest Nuestra Palabra with uh, Tony Diaz. So I hope you enjoy. Ser o no ser, esa es la cuestión. ¿Cuál más digna acción del ánimo? sufrir los tiros penetrantes de la fortuna injusta, u oponer las armas a este torrente a calamidades, y darles fin con atrevida resistencia? To die, to sleep, no more. And by asleep, to say we end. The heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to tis a consummation, devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled up this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity up so long life. Esta perdición nos hace a todos cobardes. 
Así, la natural tintura del valor se debilita con los barnices pálidos de la prudencia. Las empresas de mayor importancia, por esta sola consideración, mudan camino. No se ejecutan y se reducen a designios vanos. Pero, soft you now, the fair Ophelia, nymph and thy horizons, be all my sins, remember. That's awesome. Thank you for... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Had it timed right to end with Tony saying that it's awesome because it is. <laughs> um, Hold on, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I think just click right to the left of the YouTube. You have the little yellow square that says Humanities Texas. Um, Do you see? Yeah, on your tabs. Oh yeah, sorry. The screen share is. I'm I'm getting it. Um, the screen share was covering it. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um. So the um, the fourth example that we want to show you before we return to our questions and open up to a discussion um, is a bit further afield than the examples that we've shown you thus far. We've looked at a performance of Shakespeare's text, a modern English translation, a bilingual translation slash adaptation. Um, and this poem is called El Hamlet Fronterizo by the performance artist Guillermo Gomez Peña. And it's a po his poetic take on the to be or not to be soliloquy um, that was first written in 1988 and then rewritten in 2010. And, and before I play the poem itself, I just wanna show you two slides of where this poem takes place. So he tells us in the opening lines that this place, this, and he tells us in the, in the title here, or the subtitle that it takes place in Playas de Tijuana, which is the city that, um, where Tijuana um, meets San Diego or Imperial Beach, California. In 1988, when he first wrote this poem and imagined his border hamlet straddling the border, this is what this site looked like. The fence, it was a chain link fence, did not, ex it, it's terminated on the beach. Whereas today, or in 2022, it's actually changing as we speak. We can see in the next slide, um, there's currently a steel fence that extends all the way into the ocean, demarcating the border, and then a secondary fence um, that permit that does not permit anyone even to approach that site where his hamlet is imagined to be straddling the border. So I think those contexts are very important for thinking about how he's conjuring the border itself in his reimagining of the to be or not to be soliloquy. So now we'll we'll play him um, performing his poem. You can just go forward, Kate, because I, I duplicated the slide. El Hamlet Fronterizo, Playas de Tijuana, 1988. Border State Park, facing the formidable Pacific Ocean with one foot on each country, I talk to my other self, a dos voces interiores. Me ama, no me ama. Me caso, no me caso. Me canso, no me canso. Chicano, Mexicano, que soy o me imagino. Regreso, continúo. Me mato, no me mato. En México, en califas. To write or to perform. En inglés or in Spanish. I hate you. Nah, I forgive you. Nah, I crave for you, mi loca. Ansiosamente tuyo, de nadie más, frontera mediante, te espero, mi chuca, te sigo esperando, you are it. Tu llanto, tu make-up, tus cicatrices. No, you are definitely not it. You don't even exist yet. Thank you. And, and this really, I think, speaking of beautiful accents to hear him speaking both languages. Um, so I thought we could return, or we thought we could return to our initial questions to, um, to engage in a, in a group conversation about these four examples and what they might offer to you and to your students. 
Um, so you can choose any one of these questions to think about what strategies you might use or have used. Do you use performance? Um, what translation activities might be successful for you and your students thinking about the types of languages that your students use and speak? Um, how might you incorporate these texts and, and how might they um, encourage students to approach Shakespeare in ways that feel culturally sustaining rather than alienating? So we'd love to hear your thoughts either in the chat or feel free to, to unmute yourself and contribute to the discussion. And feel free to share any reactions you have to these materials. Yeah, our questions, I know we went through them fairly quickly, so we're definitely open to a conversation about whatever you'd all like to talk about. Feel free to unmute yourself, anyone. I was just, part of why I took this, this second class with y'all is I grew up in Texas, but I have been gone for about 20 years. My husband was in the service and just understanding this tension between in the border that exists and not being aware of it. Um, for me, I'm up in Comal County, which is New Braunfels. It's it's very it's very moving because I'm thinking about my emergent bilingual students I have as we are reading Shakespeare. And because we're at a early college campus, these are these are students that are further along the continuum and they're ability to speak both languages. And when I hear it in Spanish, it makes me think about how all of my kids hear it when they're hearing that Shakespeare for the first time to where you're like, you're, you're listening very closely and it adds a musicality to it that I never really got as a native English speaker. Mm -hmm. So to me, this has been very transformative. It's made me think a lot about how I choose and what I choose to present to my students as I'm coming from Florida to here. And I have, you know, 40 to 50% of my class is of Latina or Latino origins. And I need to be aware of that. And I think, I think that's been the important lesson for me on this, that there are other sources I can use that y'all have provided so many resources Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of what what counts as poetry? What does poetry sound like? Whose voice gets to be poetic? Whose voice gets to be philosophical, I think is really powerful. Um, Kate is contributing in the chat about uh, performance, engaging our, our students in performance um, through props and acting out. I love this idea of teenage slang, right? Hamlet is after all a teenager. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I think having him speak in, in a teenage language makes a lot of sense. Hi. 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 I want to give a shout out to Jen. Hi, Jen. Good to see you. Sorry. I, we both live in Comal. I mean, I, I live in Comal County. I teach, however, in Bayer County. I teach on the um, in the SAISD, actually, slash Edgewood uh, School District. So when I'm looking at this, um, I've got a class of reluctant learners. Not until that didn't come out right of kids who are so smart, but they are underachievers. And when I'm looking at this, I heard somebody else say slang. Um, you know, my kids are, about, or they're all Latinos, but they, most of them don't speak Spanish. They understand some Spanish, but they don't speak it because it's like, it's a two gener, it's a couple generations away. They, they know when their grandparents are yelling at them. Mm -hmm. But going to slang, instead of having something, you know, something was beautiful as a poem, it might even be not what they're interested in, but going into slang, because I was just thinking about how we talk, how listening to, to them talk in class is hilarious and wonderful, and adapting their own voice to something like this, to a Hamlet or to a Romeo and Juliet, I think might make it, um, might make it more, they're so smart though, uh, might make it so relatable to them. Right. Today I was talking to them about the word riz because that made it to the Oxford Dictionary. And they were thinking, <laughs> well, it told me that there's nothing riz about my class. So that's why they would be using it in my class. I said, okay, great, fine, thanks. Um, back at you. But then that got them really interested in looking up other words of the year. So, and they were laughing about it. So I think something like this that might talk to them, just giving them that chance, even if it's not the whole play. And I hope I'm not out of line by saying this, but not the whole play, but really good snippets. I love Hamlet's not my favorite play, but the fact that he can't make up his mind until it's too late is a really big deal. 
Yeah. You want to throw that out there. So using, so someone else said it using your own slang. I just kind of got a wake up call today in class. So thanks. Of course. Thank you. I think what's so powerful about slang is it's often, you know, it's often, um, derided or treated as lesser than, but really like that's some of the most creative language use. And, and, you know, you said your students are so smart, like people think playing with language. I mean, that is, that is so exciting and to tap into that energy for them. I mean, it feels very Shakespearean to me, actually. They, people will say Shakespeare made up words. I'm not sure he was quite making up words, but I think he was, he was playing with words um, and sometimes inventing new things by, you know, capturing the slang of his day. Yeah, um, things that weren't otherwise written down, which then <laughs> become attributed to him, right? So definitely. There were some other comments in the chat, um, people sharing uh, ideas about film adaptations, using film versions, and then encouraging students to make their own films. I mean, our students are masters at making videos these days. I feel like they're way ahead of me. <laughs> Uh, in that so we could harness those uh, activities and, th and thinking about what kinds of media they consume. I see some comments here about telenovelas um, or reality television. So I think that translating not just into other vernaculars, but thinking about other genres and mediums can be a really exciting way to engage their creativity. I wanted to say as well to um, your point, Patty, about um, students um, sort of facility with um, Spanish or or kind of discomfort um, with it. Um, the play Hamlet El Principe de Denmark does deal with questions of language loss and kind of the colonial histories that lead to that. It's an interesting, it's kind of interesting for students to think through because the play is set in, in, in indigenous Mexico but the indigenous characters speak Spanish to reflect the fact that like the, you know, um, people alive today who are, you know, related to, right, the um, people who have inherited that culture probably do speak Spanish in many cases, or their parents did, right, like because of Spanish colonization, but then the colonists speak English. So to kind of show that like double colonization that people have experienced in terms of like the loss of an indigenous language and then the loss of the Spanish language in, you know, fear of, you know, English. And so I think that sometimes students can get really interested in that too, because they think they've sometimes spent their whole lives thinking like, well, I don't really speak like proper Spanish or I don't really speak proper English or whatever, like how am I supposed to engage with Shakespeare? But to see a play that's really like engaging with those histories can be really fruitful. Okay, are we ready for a bio break? Yes, and I hope that you're all taking great notes on the chat because you're sharing such great ideas with each other. Uh, so yeah, let's take a five minute bio break. Welcome back. Yay. I just got a couple of minutes to look through the chat and it is really vital. There's so many good things going on in there. I hope that you all um, save it. So um, we're gonna move into an even more interactive portion of our webinar today. And we would like to kind of outline what that's gonna look like before we give you some materials to work with. So our activity will be centered around incorporating young women's voices. A lot of what we've been talking about today um, has been read through um, uh, masculine voice. And so we're going to see some adaptations, some appropriations of um, the Hamlet soliloquy and character through um, not just a woman's voice, but a Mexican American women's voices. So in order to do that, we'll be showing you a performance of Iris de Andas, To Be a Pocha or Not to Be and then discussing um, a portion of Guadalupe Garcia McCall's um, Under the Mesquite novel, uh, To Be or Not To Be Mexican. So we'll place these texts um, in conversation with one another. Um, the novel by Garcia McCall is uh, in verse. And so we're gonna be analyzing those two poems and then designing a lesson plan based on them, and then come back together to share out insights and questions. 
So we hope this will be a fruitful activity for you all. Great. Um, so I thought I would introduce you to the two texts in brief um, and then give you the opportunity to, to read them more closely to with each other with some guiding questions. So the first is, as Adriano was saying, Iristanda's poem, To Be a Bocha or Not to Be. And the text of both of the um, poems are, are in the Google Classroom, if you want to follow along there. Iris Dayanda is a poet of Mexican and Salvadoran descent, and she lives in Los Angeles. Um, and she's performed this poem in a number of contexts, not just at poetry events, but also on a television show called East Los High, which was an ed teen edutainment drama. Um, and so this poem, um, like Gomez Pena, takes Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy as its inspiration, but is doing um, very different things to think about her border subjectivity and her subjectivity as a Latina. So I thought we could play her reading um, this poem. Um, I just wanted to actually address Jennifer's question um, about the term bocha. Um, it is a term that was intended to be um, an insult and to be used um, derogatorily um, toward Mexican Americans who had become too assimilated, who didn't speak Spanish. Um, but as early as, well, probably earlier actually, but but during the 90s, there was a kind of concerted effort to reclaim the term. And I think Deanda is, is kind of um, reclaiming it here and 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 you all will probably talk about where she pl places the word pocha in Hamlet's to be or not to be um, which is different from what Garcia McCall does where she says to be or not to be Mexican so the placement of that word is a kind of enunciation of being right she is a pocha or she doesn't exist so that might be an interesting conversation to have with students um, but I don't want to and if I might go ahead please I just wanted to interject one more thing. Um, one of the earliest, um, uh, said to have been one of the earliest like instances of Chicano literature is Pocho by Jose Antonio Villarreal in which he talks through or thinks through some of these um, ideas. And so I think there's a, a literary heritage too um, in Mexican American literature, you know, specifically related to this phrase to this um, identity marker. So you can kind of trace the lineage. Thank you. And I'll just say a little bit about Guadalupe Garcia McCall's novel, Under the Mesquite. You, some of you may be familiar with her as a young adult um, novelist. She wrote a novel called Shame the Stars. That's an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Um, but under this novel, Under the Mesquite, is the story of Lupita, um, who's a young Mexican-American girl growing up in Eagle Pass, but constantly crossing the border, both literally and culturally, to, to spend time with family. Um, and she is under enormous pressure to assimilate in school, but finds herself um, being made fun of by other Mexican-Americans who see her as sort of talking as if she's white or performing in ways that register as whiteness. So this um, this chapter, which is in some ways a standalone poem because the, the novel is written in verse, grapples with these questions of her identity using Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy as its framework. So... In a moment, we will put you in breakout groups. And we also have um, a Google Doc, which we'll share. And so we'll put that in the chat um, and you'll be able to write down some responses in it, as well as kind of have a conversation in your groups. And there are two main components uh, to the what you'll be doing in the breakout groups. The first is to really do some analysis of these two poems, both of which are in the Google Drive. So you can think through what they're doing by engaging with Hamlet's to be or not to be speech, um, what um, poetic strategies they're drawing upon to adapt it, to express the lived experiences and existential dilemmas of young Mexican Americans, especially young Mexican American women, um, and to think, think through some of these questions of identity that they're wrestling with. 
Um, and then how they're embracing, right, this consciousness of the borderlands. Like, what does it mean to use this character, Hamlet, who's so associated with a kind of Western consciousness or sometimes human consciousness to think really specifically about like young women's, young Mexican-American women's consciousness in the borderlands. So that's the first step. And you'll see here that we do have some vocabulary, um, uh, mostly from to be a pocha or to not to be, um, but also there's the term uh, reboso or, or shawl um, or scarf, um, which appears in um, McCall's piece as well. Um, and then the next, yes, thank you. Let's see, the next um, part we'll be thinking about the lesson plan. So um, here we'd like you to think about how you might um, present one or both of these poems to your class and whether you might want to pair it with other pieces, whether that might be, you know, the to be or not to be speech or some of the other works that we have shared today, such as Guillermo Gomez Pena's piece or Ansel Duas to live in the borderlands means you um, or some of like the, the bilingual soliloquies or performances. Um, and we'd also love um, for you to think about, I mean, some of these questions that you've all been wrestling with, like your students right, have different backgrounds, different identities, different language backgrounds, different cultural experiences. To, so how would you um, create a lesson plan that accounts for some of these um, differences in their backgrounds and identities? Um, and also um, what kinds of poetic literacy um, questions or issues might you um, kind of use these poems to engage with. I know some of you in your introductory um, kind of, you know, your answers to the questions about what you're hoping to get out of this webinar. We're interested in helping students really with like comprehension and literacy concerns. So how might using these um, two works specifically, but maybe some of the others we talked about also kind of help students develop these multilingual literacies and what challenges would you anticipate? So those are some questions. We'd like to give you about 15 minutes in the breakout rooms. Um, and then we'll come back together for another 15 minutes or so to have a conversation about what you discussed, as well as any broader questions that the material we've presented today has brought up for you all or comments, since we're learning a lot from you as well. Okay, I'll stop sharing so that we can facilitate the breakout rooms a little more easily. I hope you enjoyed your discussion. In our final moments here today, we really want to just open it up and hear from you um, what ideas came through. Please feel free to unmute or type in the chat. Feel free to address any of the questions that we asked on this slide, or I can also flip to the second slide as well. Well, one of the things we talked about in our group was uh, just the, the, the idea of basic agency for our students who come from uh, different backgrounds. We talked about, because in, in our group, we're all from all over the state. And so um, we were talking about how we have some students who uh, who don't have agency, they've come, I mean, th they're new to our school, they're new uh, perhaps to English, and they're dedicated, they want to learn. And we're hoping that maybe some of these, I hope anybody in my group, please tell me if I'm wrong, that some of the, some of these works, especially when we look at them as, in a, as a border work or as a, as a continual lingu uh, language uh, work, uh, integrated language work, will really give agency to those students who really want to um, to participate and now they have the means to do so and we're not trying to assimilate them or anything like that we just want you know their language counts it matters it's really important and uh, that's one of the big things we were talking about thank you so much for sharing that patty that's amazing lisa i saw that you had a thumbs up and also contributed in the chat do you want to add to what patty was saying Yeah, no, no, I was just supporting her. I mean, I don't know that I could eloquently put together everything we talked about in our group. And I feel like Patty and Fernando are more of the authority in kind of what we talked about, just based on the student populations they were discussing. 
But, um, and, and, you know, as teachers, I think we all think about what we learn in these seminars and these professional developments kind of in terms of the student populations we specifically teach, which, um, you know, being in Texas, um, we've probably all had very differentiated classes as far as culture and ability levels. And so that's definitely me. Um, but I think what we talked about is definitely helpful. Just, you know, how the different languages in a poem can reach all the readers, addressing larger issues. Um bringing out kids that already feel like they're cornered into a certain, like they can't speak a certain language or act a certain way due to different things. But then maybe you can, maybe you can set that aside when you read through these poems or find a way to connect with them. And um, just based on what point of view you come from, what part of the border you're from, what city you're from, the cultural posture you fear, the cultural pressure you fear, feel to either be not so white or maybe not so related to your home language or your culture that you were born with, depending on where you're from. I mean, there's just so many issues, but in a way that can be addressed with the poetry, I guess. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. The um, different perspectives and the variety of ways that the material can be used and applied um, is really apparent. Thank you. You mentioned that Fernando was also in your group. Did you want to share anything that came up, Fernando? Yes, I. No, no, I just wanted to thank you three of you again. It should be in your presentations again. But that, I guess, what I share with the group that now, by this time from the, the first session, I have been able to use the, the one of the, at least one of the tech, two of the texts especially the tragic corrido and that has uh just like you write in your introductions that has allowed more participation empowered students it does make it just because there's a do have these students that are very high achieving as was mentioned but they wish they could participate more but they just don't either have the confidence or just skill there's a lot of them are better writers and readers uh some either or or then uh speak but it's uh it's quite a challenge to speak a language front of a group where some, a few are native English speakers, some very dominant in the end. Having the the appropriate text translations, especially like in the tragic corrido, uh, that powers students. And I have students read in Spanish, some of the ones that I know of because, and luckily I've had them in Spanish classes and I know their great ability, but thanks to you. Works like what you promote, what you edited, published, that's, uh, that can make such a difference because if not, students are not going to be able to participate as much as they're reading from uh, just the, the original text or all in English. But thank you again. That is amazing to hear. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, student engagement is um, so important and it's what we're aiming for. So I, I just love that you shared that. Would anybody else like to contribute to this discussion? I was going to say as well that I really like your point, Patty, in the chat about that we're all language learners and really having a classroom that's open to that, right? And open to thinking about everyone as, you know, kind of different places in terms of various languages that they're, you know, that they know, have facility with, et cetera. I like that idea. And I think too, to add to that, um, that we're all potentially poets, right? That that what I think is really powerful about these two examples is, is to think about, especially Garcia McCall's novel, to think about this young protagonist um, speaking through verse, uh, that, that it might empower students not only to see poetry as something that they can access, but also something that they can make. That to me feels like a real, I'm sure is a real um, concern for many teachers of English language arts to, to kind of get over particular barriers around poetry. What a beautiful part. Just a couple of different things too, and kind of building on what everyone's been saying, but the idea that um, I brought up, I probably even partner some of these with Pat Mora's Legal Alien so they can have that discussion also. Um, and 
and really take the to be or not to be, we talk about be verbs, it's you exist or you don't exist. And and I have a lot of, as well do varying students from varying backgrounds, but um, I can see many of them if we said to exist as your true identity or not to exist and conform to societal expectations. Um, many students, uh, I some of my LGBTQ plus students um, have tried to express this, those sentiments in uh, other poetry and other writing. I think that would create a uh, an outlet sort of for them talking about it in this context to be or not to be. Um, and then looking at, as we said, the, all of these other pieces um, with identity, having a moment to discuss who they are and who they feel like they're expected to be um, or the constraints put on them. And, and even this is a great way for them to talk about everything, politics, family, without necessarily having to be super direct with it as, as well. We talk about place and we talk about, um, you know, then and now well, their students can talk about all of the current events and all of their belief systems. Um, and this is an excellent opportunity if we show them all of these pieces and say, what stands out to you in this one? Okay, it's the imagery, right? What sounds out to you in this one? Okay, it's the direct lines. Take all those things that stood out to you and use those to write your poem. And so they have that those as building blocks too. So. Thank you all for your incredible shares. It's so interesting to hear how you're each gonna um, or have been incorporating these texts into your classrooms. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight um, in December, <laughs> at the end of the semester. I know you're all really busy and um, we appreciate you spending your time here with us. Um, so we would love to stay in touch with you. Um, we want to hear what you're teaching, how you're teaching, what successes and challenges you might be facing. So consider this an open invitation to be in touch with us. Our email address is at the bottom of this um, slide, borderlandshakespeare at gmail.com. And we are active on social media, thanks to our wonderful media manager, um, who's a former student of mine. And so we would love to, to be in touch with you there. Um, and we have a conference coming up in March and we'll have the details of that on the next slide. Um, and we invite you to attend. Uh, and if you'd like to um, talk about your teaching or share what you and your students are up to, there'll be lots of other teachers at all different levels um, talking about the tradition of Borderland Shakespeare and, and what kinds of opportunities it opens up for our students. There'll be performances of new works, um, and really a celebration of Borderlands communities. So please join us in San Antonio in March.